Hi everyone and welcome to what I read in August. Now I read 17 books, two of those were romances, five of those were thrillers, and 10 of those were cozies. So we're gonna go through all of those today in order in those, like I've grouped them together. I used to just like do a random order, that is too hard to like follow. So I'm gonna group them together for you. And then within those groups, I'm gonna go from like the books that I rated a five down to three. And I actually have a bunch of fives this month. I had a really good reading month. I know last month it was like all one. Someone was like commented, they're like, sorry, you had such a bad month. Hope next month is better. So this was a good month. So let's go through that list. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Lisa, author of the Frosted Misfortunes Cozy Mystery Series starring my own little kitty cat, Lucky. On this channel, we talk all about mysteries, whether those are books, TV shows, or movies. So if this sounds like you or something you might be interested in, make sure to hit the subscribe button below. I post new videos every Tuesday. So let's get into that list. Let's go through the romances first. So there were two books, spoiler alert, I gave both of these a five. They were fabulous and they're both clean uh, romances. The second one has some closed door uh, sex, but otherwise you could feel safe reading these if that is like, if you're worried about those things. Uh, the first one is Once Upon a Royal Summer by Terry Wilson. Now, Terry Wilson, if you didn't know this, is a fabulously wonderful author who writes a ton of sweet romances for the Hallmark Channel as well as movies for them. So if you like the Hallmark Channel, which I very much do, I can 100% guarantee you're gonna love her books. Now, she do also does the books in reverse where like there's already a movie out and then it gets made into a novel, if that makes sense. Uh, so either way, all of her books, I can say with confidence, you'll love if you like the Hallmark Channel. So this one is about a princess who is a theme park princess, I know. It was like, I was like, oh, that's interesting. I've never read a book where they do that. And I really actually liked it. And so there is a real prince though that comes over. He has a daughter, he's widowed, and he wants to give her the perfect summer. And of course, the two of them end up hanging out. Um, the second book is Lost and Found Sisters by Jill Shalvis. And as I mentioned, I gave this a five. And this is, again, Jill Shalvis books. At the end of them, my mom was like, oh, I wish this book didn't end, which is kind of the sign of a good romance. Now this one was marketed as women's fiction. She even said this is my first women's fiction, but she did a great job of balancing that along with the romance. So you still get a happily ever after in case you're like, all I've ever read are romances from Jill Chavez. It still reads just like a romance. Basically it's a woman who is a cook, she's a chef, and she finds out that she's inherited a cafe or something like that from her birth mother, but the catch is she didn't even even know she was adopted and so she calls up her parents they're like oh yeah we just didn't want to tell you and so and she also has a, well she had a sister we actually don't meet her in the book but her sister died in an, a car accident and so she's really sad about that and then when she goes to this town she finds out she has another sister through her birth mother that she just never knew about and this sister is 15 and I believe she's like 26 so just 10 years older than her and there's no guardian, there's no other family, and the birth mother was really hoping that by sending her a note that she would end up taking care of her and being her guardian. So they like have some angsty, you know, I just found out I had a sister, I didn't know my mom had other kids kind of thing going on. And at the same time, there's this really hunky guy in town who honestly, I don't remember what he does aside from being hunky and just nice and helpful. So they have a romance as well. And so I don't want to ruin it for you, but it is so, so good. So those are the two romances I read for the month. So we're gonna jump over to cozies. I have 10 cozies for you, and then we're gonna do thrillers last, just because the thrillers, some of them are actually nonfiction, and in case you're like a little queasy about the subject, I will give you a warning. So in case you wanna just stop the tape, which I totally understand, but they were so good. These were, the thrillers were all fives. I, I'm telling you, it was such a great reading month. Anyways, let's get into the cozy. So the first one is Guidebook to Murder by Lynn Cahoon, and I gave this one a five. It was so good. So I've had this on my shelf forever. I can't believe I didn't read it. Basically, she inherits her friend's estate, and her friend's like super wealthy, has this huge like property, and a bunch of paintings that she did that are also worth a ton of money. However, her friend, I guess she just moved to the small town five years ago to open up a bookstore slash like cafe and her friend, this woman convinced her to do it. She was a lawyer and she must have had to do a case for this woman. They didn't really get into that because she was kind of like already established. 
but they did get into the mystery. There's like so much mystery going on. There's like paintings that are going like missing. She's getting like death threats to like leave the house. Her, the person that she inherited all of the property and the money from has real relatives that are like really angry that they didn't get anything. And then there's also a possible like related missing baby or something that could possibly be a granddaughter. It was a little confusing because the book said her son went missing during Vietnam. And then this kid shows up who's like three or four. So it's a really small child. So I don't know if this book was supposed to be like 1975 or something, but she definitely has a cell phone. So I think that was, I feel like that was just like a typo because there were no cell phones back in 1975. Anyways, so aside from that, that was the only thing that was a little off about it. Um, and she's also, her love interest is the detective. So lots of things going on. Also, she has this quirky aunt that comes down to help her run the shop. So I really like this. Um, and I will be continuing the series. The next one is Hearse and Buggy by Laura Bradford. And this is first in an Amish mystery. And I gave this one a five. I mean, you have to try really hard for me not to love your Amish cozy mystery. That is like my new favorite subject genre. Anyway, so she owns a tourist shop and um, and she bought it from somebody when she was just there on vacation. She just really liked the town. And then the old owner is killed. So honestly, there was like, what else was in? Oh, I know. So the detective is Amish, like a former Amish guy. And he comes back. He has to he's been assigned there and he needs to work with the locals. But I guess there's this Amish rule that if you leave the community, you're shunned and no one will speak to you. And so even though he's the law officer, no one will speak to him, so he can't get anything done. So she steps in and intervenes to try to help him and she talks to people and then relays the information back to him. So I really like that book. The next one is another Amish mystery. It's Secrets of the Amish Diary by Rachel Phillips. And I gave this one a four. So this is about a woman who, after her mom dies, she finds out that her mom was Amish and she never knew. So she decides to travel back to Indiana or not back to, tries to go to Indiana. She buys the Victorian B&B that her mother grew up in and then runs it as an inn. And at the same time, there's uh, someone is killed, but she, but one of the Amish people locally has been accused, but she doesn't really think he did it. But because he's Amish, he just kind of doesn't really defend himself. And so she steps in to intervene and help out. Uh, and as well as just like trying to find out information about her mother. So I really like that. And you don't, just so you know, you don't really find out anything about her mother. So I think that's like a continuing a mystery that goes on within the series. So I will be continuing that series. And the next one is Caught Dead Handed by Carol J. Perry. And I give this one a four. I really like this. I know some people didn't like it. I will say uh, just trigger, like, I don't know if it's a trigger warning, just a warning in general. This does have a grittier kind of case where you only see this in hardcore thrillers where there's like sexual abuse cases that usually aren't in cozy mysteries. So I guess that's probably why I think people were like very surprised by that because it has like a cute cover. There's this adorable cat. Anyways, this woman moves back home. She's been fired from her TV news job and she's interviewing for the TV news anchor in her small town, which usually you're like, I made it in the big city. I'm going to come back to my small town. I obviously will be fine there, but she did not get the job and said some other guy got the job. And then at the same time, that morning, she finds the body of the woman who runs this like murder movie marathon, kind of like, I don't know if you're old enough to remember Elvira from the 80s. So Elvira used to do this, I don't know what it's called, movie macabre night. I've watched those all the time. Of course, this was before the internet or before on demand. So this was like the most entertainment you could get. But she would just dress up like, I don't know what it was, like like a van. She was just dressed up like Elvira. That's kind of what we knew her as. And she would comment on these creepy horror movies and then you'd watch them and then you'd wait for the breaks to see like her commentary on it. Anyways, so it's kind of the same thing. These like horror movies are playing in the background and then in between she takes phone calls from callers and then looks in a crystal ball to like give them advice or whatever. So they're trying to figure out who murdered the person that she's taking the job over from. And at the same time, there's a cute cat that used to be 
I guess in the familiar of the person that did it before and now has become her familiar and she finds out that she might have some secret witchy powers. They don't really get into that a lot so it's kind of magical but not really. There's no talking cat or anything. She just kind of can sometimes see like psychic things. So anyways, I really like that and we'll be continuing the series. Um, the next one is Better Off Wed by Annabelle Archer. Now this is first in a wedding planner cozy mystery series, which I was super excited about the thought of it. The only issue I had is there was like a lot of cheesy 1980s humor, even though it was written like in 2015, but in the 80s, when I think of the 80s, I think of like raunchy, rude, condescending jokes that are made at other people's expense, like by making fun of them for being fat or um, unattractive or something aesthetically wrong with them or not perfect. And that's kind of how this book sort of wet and there's also some stereotypes so like she's the wedding planner and that's the main like amateur sleuth in the book and then her sidekick is this super hot you know gorgeous blonde blue-eyed model looking person who's super ditzy right so a little bit like the character in clueless i guess which again i know that was 90s but it kind of reminds me of the 80s so the person who's killed is the mother of the bride and like right up until then all she does is complain about how much she hates her and can't stand her and so but then somehow she like wants to help solve the mystery so she's worried about her reputation as a wedding planner which didn't kind of make sense but I kind of went with it I didn't hate it I mean I give it a three but I probably will not be continuing the series um the next book is Calico Confusion by Katherine Hayden and I gave this a three so this is a kitty cafe which who wouldn't love the idea of a kitty cafe? And I read some reviews where people were like, oh, this is so gross that kittens are running around in a cafe. But I find that adorable. And I think that's really cute. And yes, there might be a stray cat here or something in your food, but that's the price you pay for kitty cuteness. It's really not that big of a deal. Anyways, so the cat cafe, uh, just so you know, there's no romance in this one, which isn't really a big deal, but usually there's always like some hint of summer. There was absolutely no romance anywhere. And there's just, there. there's a victim, someone down the street from the cat cafe is killed and then she ends up taking in her cat and that's kind of, that's kind of it. I mean, honestly, I this book was a super quick read. I think it was one of the shorter books and it went by fast. So I probably won't continue, continue the series, but I enjoyed reading it, um, which I think is always fine. Uh, the next one is Murder Always Barks Twice by Jennifer Hawkins. Now, I absolutely love this one. I did give this a three. Um, it was because it kind of dragged in some parts, but it was super cute. It has this cute little corgi and he's Cornish because uh, it's from, they're in Cornwall and I guess they speak Cornish. I'm not really familiar with the accent. It did have an accent. It didn't really sound like that. When you think of British accents, mostly I think you hear people from London. So this was cute though and the dog was so adorable and he kept like warning her all the time um with like cute little doggy thoughts so he wasn't like super eloquent so it was like a perfect character and sidekick but basically she is um she's helping to organize this literary festival and the organizer of the literary festival is killed i don't know you know a lot of times in books i read about these literary festivals i don't even think literary festivals are that big of a deal even though I'm a writer and I love books, I do not at all get excited by literary festivals. I don't know. They just seem kind of boring and you just have a lot of people standing around looking at books. There's like nothing going on. I don't know. Maybe I haven't been to a good literary festival. That could be it. I also don't get into those, uh, the Renaissance fairs, like getting dressed up. I don't know. I mean, if we did like an ice cream social slash book literary festival, I could totally get excited about that. <laughs> Anyways, um, this was a, this was the second book in the series. So that might be also why I didn't like it as much because I probably should have started with the first, but I was super excited. I got this through NetGalley and the book starts out with her wanting to investigate the like who killed the organizer of the literary festival and the family of the the victim is worried that like the victim wasn't really killed they're saying it was suicide she like fell out a window and the family's like well she needs to investigate she needs to do this because the police won't investigate and all the men in the family think it was an accident and should be left alone so 
I'm guessing from the first book, she has like a reputation for being like a like hardcore amateur sleuth that like figures things out. So the next book is One Taste Too Many by Deborah Goldstein. And I gave this book a three. This is about twin sisters. And the thing is, I don't even know if they're identical or fraternal. It doesn't even tell you that. And the fact that they're twins does not come into play at all. One sister who is the narrator of the book, it's written in first person, is like this super loser. She is divorced and has this like secretary job that she doesn't really care about and she has no talent or aspirations to really do anything. And then there's the other sister who is this rock star chef and she's at some big competition and her sister's ex-husband has been murdered. He's been poisoned by one of her rhubarb cakes or something, which I didn't even know rhubarb could be a like food sensitive poison item that you'd need an anaphylactic uh, or an EpiPen for because you go into anaphylactic shock. But apparently he died from the rhubarb pie, which I I don't know anything about rhubarb, but I would think like the taste is so strong you wouldn't eat a rhubarb pie if you are like deathly allergic to them. Anyways, she, in the meantime, so her sister's been accused of it. She goes off to jail and she has to step in for her sister to help cook. And even though she has like, she admits, she's like, I know nothing about cooking. I have zero talent. They're all like, you need to step up and help, which doesn't make any sense because she's like a self-declared loser and has zero talent. So, but they're like making her help with cooking and it's just making it awful. In the meantime, she has this cat that she received from her ex-mother-in-law, so the mom of her ex-husband, who's now dead, he's the victim, and the cat's named Rara. She loves the cat. She's had it for years, and for some reason, there's his girlfriend, her ex-husband's girlfriend, comes forward and is like, the cat is mine. I need the cat, and you have to give it to me, and so even though she's had it for years, her lawyer, who she works for, is this loser who also is like, oh, I guess there's nothing you can do. Paperwork just says you have to give up your cat. There is no way I would give up my cat, like, ever. Like, I would go into kitty witness relocation. I know, there, you're like, there's no such thing. But, you know, I would not give my cat to anybody. I don't care what the paperwork says. Like, you just be like, I don't know what happened to Lisa's YouTube videos. She disappeared. It's because I ran away so that someone could not take my cat. <laughs> But the ex-husband, I guess, the cat, according to his mother's will, came with $500,000 to take care of it, as well as the house, which she received neither of them, again, because she's a loser, she didn't even check. And on top of that, the girlfriend, like, takes the cat. Like, I would just work out a deal with her and just be like, I will keep the cat, because clearly you don't like it anyway, and you take the money and the house. Like, I, this woman didn't even want the cat. So it is so bizarre, uh, but I gave it a three, because it still kept me interested, because I was like, I can't, like, what happens to the cat? Anyways. That was that book. Uh, the next book is Brand New Death by Victoria Hamilton. Now, this one I gave a three to. And this one, again, I won't be continuing that other series, uh, One uh, Taste Too Many or this one. They were OK to read. They were like entertaining enough. But this one is about a woman who inherits a huge mansion from her rich dead uncle. And there are families like famous in this town because it's like this huge like plantation kind of place. And they're broke, though. The family's broke. She's broke. And for some reason, her first thought when inheriting this place is to start selling muffins. Now, there is nothing wrong with selling muffins, but it kind of was like, I don't know, be an adult, like open up an Airbnb if you have this huge place or make it a bed and breakfast or I don't know. It just seemed very bizarre to me that she wants to sell muffins. It's like the 10 year old down the street who's opening up a lemonade stand like muffins are, I don't even know, two dollars each, if that. And she has no place to sell them. It, Anyways, on top of that, there is a bunch of holes in her backyard. Like someone has gone out there with one of those huge like cranes that dig up the earth and put big holes in there. Like I'm assuming they're that big because someone dies in one of the holes because he fell in. So I'm assuming they're like massively huge holes. And the people who are doing the digging 
they suspect are the brother's sister who own the bakery in town. And they think that her uncle killed their father and hid the body on the estate. So that's why they keep digging up holes to look for the body. Now, in the meantime, to make her muffins uh, so she can make money, she does not have a working stove at the mansion. So she needs to use the stove at the bakery. She doesn't even ask. She just kind of shows up and the woman's like, okay, you can use the stove. Like, it, it was very odd. And then the victim who dies is actually her brother while he was out on her property uh, looking at the woman who owned the, inherited the mansion. She's out on her, he's out on her property digging holes and he's the one that died. So now she's a suspect. So um, yeah, I mean, it was interesting, but very just like a weird setup. So there was that book. And then the last one is Moving as Murder by Sarah Rosette. And I gave this book a three. And you know, the thing is, I will not be continuing the series, mostly because the main character is like a huge, like, I want to say Debbie Downer, but that's not it. She's like a complaining Kathy. I don't know if there's a phrase for that. All she did was complain and everything. Like, I hate this. I hate people. I hate moving. I hate <laughs> trucks. I hate diapers. I hate parties. I like, she literally hated everyone and everything she encountered. It was super, super negative. And I don't even care. Like on the Clifton Strengths, like one through 34, number 34 is positivity. So I don't even, it's not even that important to me, but just it did great on my nerves how she just complained about everything. So in the description for the book, it says that they're all upset because they had accidentally relocated to Devil's Keep. So Devil's Keep is the name of the neighborhood. And two things. One, I thought maybe it was slightly paranormal. It is not. And two, I thought maybe there was something ominous or sinister about why it's called Devil's Keep. That is not it at all. The reason that she doesn't like moving into Devil's Keep is because she hates people. And all of the people that her husband is an army something or something in the military, and all of the military families also live there. So I don't know if he's like higher up or something because he's a pilot, but she kind of felt like they were above and beyond like all the people in his unit. So she was like, I hate Devil's Keep because everybody from the military is here and now they might come over and say hello so I don't know it was very bizarre how she hated and then she hated like that she had to find a new hairdresser when she moved which I kind of feel like if you had married a military guy that's what you signed up for you kind of know it's not like a big surprise anyways so she has this new more baby. Here's one positive though. Um, there was another book I read by, I think it was Reyes or something. And there was a baby in the book. And this woman was like, it was weird. She was like pedophile obsessed with her baby, like where it was creepy and weird. This one, she was like a newborn mom and she's a stay at home mom. She has no job or career or anything else going on. But she was like concerned about the baby, but not in a creepy way. Like it was like normal and it was okay. Uh, so the baby is like her sidekick. The baby comes here. The baby comes there. She doesn't talk to the baby or anything. It's just like, I don't know, this uh, this accessory <laughs> that's just always with her. Anyways, in the neighborhood that she hates to be in and she cannot stand the people, one of the army wives is murdered. She is like a happy do-gooder who's always organizing events, you know, obviously everything that this woman, the main character hates. And so she's killed. But I think she, for some reason she was barring this woman's car or something like that. And so uh, I don't know. It didn't, I was a little confused about the murder part and maybe I'd glazed over it because I was so like, I don't want to listen to anything more that she hates. But yeah, so that is why I will not be continuing that series, but it wasn't bad. I mean, two things. One, if you like murder mysteries, or not murder mysteries, army uh, like families and stories, like that would probably be good for you. Um, it did put these weird quotes in there about moving. Now, I have moved quite a bit because I've had so many corporate relocations for a new job or something like that. And it was like, in the beginning, she was like so angry. Again, she hates moving and she hated that her stuff was in storage and she hated that, you know, her things were put into a moving ban in the incorrect order. But the thing is, if you really were, because she kept giving out moving advice, which didn't make sense. Like, I've moved so much, I know that that happens. Like, you just plan for it. And it kept giving out advice, which... I feel like this the main character really wouldn't be qualified to give any of the advice anyway because she was so surprised by like little moving things. So now I am complaining <laughs> about this book and everything I hate. See, this is why I can't like read any more in this series. But 
yeah, so that's a wrap for all the cozies. Now I'm going to go into the thrillers. I do wanna warn you though, the thrillers are half of them, I shouldn't say half of them, all of them are nonfiction, but I still call them thrillers because they were so good. They read like a Stephen King novel. These are all five books are by Richard Preston. And I give all of these a five. And Richard Preston is an expert in Ebola. So if that freaks you out, because I know everything going on, um, click away. I totally understand. But these were amazing could not take my eyes off of these books and stop reading them. They are not available in audiobook, just so you know. So you can either listen to them on the Alexa app if you're able to do that, or you're gonna have to just read them the old fashioned way. But the first one, The Hot Zone, that was actually so good that they made a National Geographic mini series about that book. So it recounts the 1989 outbreak of Reston Ebola in the US, which was in Reston, uh, Virginia. Now, if you're not familiar with Reston Ebola, that is non-lethal so, to humans. So it kills pigs, it kills monkeys, other uh, species, but for humans, it doesn't It doesn't kill you. That has like no symptoms. However, it looks super scary. Like Ebola is like a super like debilitating, like will kill you within two weeks kind of disease. Um, and so it's just talking about how all of those monkeys came from the Philippines and then they had sourced those, I think, from Africa. And so they finally figured it out, right? Because it was like a private testing lab in Reston that had this issue. And then the army took over. But the scary part was, well, they wiped out all of, they made the Philippines wipe out, like kill every single monkey on their their plantation, which I think is like millions of dollars. I didn't even know that the, this was that big of an industry. So, and then they had like another problem too later on. So um, I don't even know what the solution is, but it's just fascinating to read. And he does a really great job with getting a lot of good details, but not in a boring scientific way. Like you're like totally enraptured into this book. Um, the second one was Demon in the Freezer. And that one talks about the 2001 anthrax attacks and recounting like the whole investigation and trying to figure out who the culprit was and why he was doing it. Um, the third one is Crisis in the Red Zone. So this one goes all the way back to 1976, which is when the first Ebola outbreak was in, I believe, uh, Africa. So the theory is that Ebola comes from the Kitsune Caves. I don't know if I'm saying that right, but they're salt caves that elephants go in there all the time to lick the salt. And I can't remember the word, but by licking the salt off of the salt caves, it kind of shapes the cave into what it is. There are lots of bats living in there and the bats are believed to be vectors for Ebola. So if you're not familiar with viruses, they usually need a vector to like help them mature and grow. And then the vector spreads it to the end recipient who actually ends up dying for it. So the, vet, so the bats don't die from the Ebola. They simply like just house it and make it better and mature it and then ship it out, I guess, for, from their like biological factory. Um, that's kind of like how a virus vector works. But there were kids playing. There was a little boy playing in the cave. He got sick and then his parents got sick. Um, and when I say sick, they all died. So uh, that was the first time they ever discovered Ebola. So it also goes through a lot of interesting information on how Ebola was so easily able to be spread in Africa because in the Congo region, which is where it was mainly concentrated, there is a practice there when the people die of like holding the sick, taking care of the sick, uh, and also bathing in the same water as the dead body, which obviously are all breeding grounds for Ebola. And that's why it was spreading. So they had brought in a lot of scientists to try to help educate them. And eventually it did go away. They ended up doing what's called reverse quarantine on a lot of places where they would cut trees down and actually block people from coming in versus like stopping people from going out. So once Ebola had broken out somewhere, one village or town or like area was like, we don't want it. And so they had like blocked anyone from like entering their village. Uh, so that was another way that they, which was interesting on how they had done it. So just so you know that there there was in a vaccine approved for Ebola, I believe a couple of years ago, they mostly give the vaccine out in Zaire, which is, I believe the most recent outbreak was from just last year or 2018 or 2016. And in December of 2020, the FDA approved a uh, cure 
for Ebola. So there now is a cure out there. So that was, there, there was a sad story. So the Ebola cure came out, they were experimenting, there were tons of people experimenting with creating cures for the Ebola vaccine like years ago. And because most of the doctors that are there helping to treat Ebola in Africa, are Doctors Without Borders, which has a really strict policy on not allowing special medicine to be given to anyone because of their class or their status. And so there was a doctor who came down with it. And instead of like, I guess in my mind, I think it's okay to treat the doctor because the doctor, if he's treated, can then stay there and help treat many more people. But they had decided, even though they had the cure, like literally down the hall from the doctor, they would not give it to him because they said it was politically incorrect to do so. And so he ends up dying. Um, it's very, it's like a really tragic story. And then later they decide to use it on to military pe personnel. I believe, I don't know if I'm quoting that right, but they end up living and surviving, even though they split the dosage, which you're not supposed to, uh, between the two people. So he could have lived if he had gotten even just like half of that dosage. Uh, and then um, the next one was panic in level four. Now this one was kind of a little bit more meh. It was like a rehashing of what had already been talked about as well as two really boring uh, tangents on things. Like one was the uh, Russian scientists living on the Upper West Side in New York and they were trying to build a supercomputer in their apartment to figure out there was a true meaning of pi, which I'm sure as you know, pi is 3.14, and then it has like infinite numbers after it, so they were trying to figure that out, which I did kind of find kind of boring. And then the second one, um, there's this weird uh, genetic disease that causes self-cannibalism, and I think the reason he talked about that is because the last book that I read was The Cobra Event. Now, The Cobra Event is fiction, and that was Excellent. So he said he wanted to make it a book that was nonfiction, but he couldn't get enough people to go on record to confirm that they were data sources or to go on record saying that they'd provided the information, which I guess you need that for a nonfiction book. So instead he made it a fiction book where there is a an outbreak of someone combining the self-cannibalism, uh, like genetic disorder, along with Ebola, and just doing a test experiment in the US. So, um, so that was super interesting, and I loved all five of those books. I really wish he would write more books. I mean, the first book, uh, The Hot Zone, was written years and years ago, so it's, I don't think he's like, a, he's writing a bunch of books. They, they like come out every seven years or something, so. It's highly likely we'll see another book, but excellent, excellent series and writing. I highly recommend it. So that's a wrap for what I read in August. Like I said last month, and I really mean it this time, I am not going to read as many books in September. In fact, I am deleting social media from my phone. So no Facebook, no Instagram, no, uh, what is that other app that everyone talks on, Discord. Like I'm totally disconnecting to get some words in because I didn't get any words written for August, even though I wanted to write 80,000. And when I thought about where I spent my time, I did manage to check Facebook and Instagram every single day. Like, how sad is that? Like, so that's why also another reason we really meant it when we said we were excited about moving over to Patreon for the Cozy Escape Book Club and the Para Cozy Book Club. Everything's going to be on Patreon. There's no extra noise. There's no clutter. The only thing I'm getting are feeds from the two memberships I pay for and what information from and Cozy Escape members, which I definitely want to connect with, and nothing else from social media. So that is the plan for September. We'll see how it goes. I will report back in again next month. All right, remember, tomorrow we are doing the VIP session for the September Cozy Escape group. I really hope you can be there. We're super excited. We have a fabulous workbook for you to help you plan out September, as well as Courtney and I are sharing everything that we did in August and all of our plans for September. And then we have 10, no, that's not true. We have 20 videos, so 10 each, 10 on my channel, 10 on Courtney's channel, starting tomorrow with a recap of all of the Cozy Escape book awards that were nominated to help you try to vote, pick the book that you love. So at the end, hopefully we'll have some really great recommendations and suggestions for people. All right, I hope everyone's having a fabulous day, and I will talk to you guys tomorrow. <laughs> Bye.